picture. Good morning, Gateway. You all doing all right? It's so good to be with you all and all those that are joining us online. Uh, this time, make sure the students go with Philip. Um, you know, there are other football teams than the Browns. I'm just, I just want to say that and get that out there, but to Philip, there's no others that matter. So, but good for him. I mean, 20 years of just being downtrodden and he can celebrate a little bit this year. So, uh, there you go. See, there he is back there. So, give, I'm happy for him and uh, he finally can wear his jerseys proudly. But anyways, um, I just, I'm so excited to be here. I'm Russ Jordan. I'm the Beckley campus minister and um, not Dave. Uh, he's actually went to Beckley today. We kind of switched places. Um, but, uh, you know, the last time I was with you all, if you remember, I, uh, I had the money sermon. You remember that? I had to uh, preach and teach on money. Well, I looked at this series, this 10-week series that we've been going through the, uh, the Ten Commandments in Exodus chapter, chapter 20, and I thought for sure I was going to get thou shall not commit adultery. I thought for sure when I came up here I'd be teaching the sex sermon, you know. But i tell you a little funny story about that sermon. Um, two weeks before that sermon came up uh, in Beckley, I, I performed a wedding for a couple. And uh, after they went on their honeymoon, you know, I've heard this before when I've done weddings for people that didn't go to church, uh, uh, church with me. They said, well, we'll be in church the next Sunday. And I'm like, yeah, okay, you know, hopefully you will. I want you to be You're more than welcome. I'd love to see that happen. Well, guess what Sunday they show up on? The sex sermon, all right? It was great. And, and, and so, and what's even crazier, they came back the next week. So, you know, so uh, that's, a, that's a good sign. And we're uh, and just enjoying them. And it's great to uh, see some good things happening in Beckley right now. We have moved to the Beckley-Raleigh County uh, Convention Center, which is, if you've been down that way, it's the Armory. And it's a great location. Uh, and so we're seeing some new faces and seeing God do some cool stuff down there. So, again, I want to thank you all for your support of our campus uh, as we pray and support St. Albans and Taze Valley and now Marmette and uh, Haiti. Uh, the Martins are down in Haiti as we speak, uh, down there doing some, some mission work. So it's just awesome to see God doing some great things in, in, in all these campuses. So I'm, I'm thankful and humbled to be with you. And I get uh, commandment number nine out of our uh, Ten Commandments. And I, I just want to start off with a question, if I can. You know, and I think we're all wondering this, right? We're a little over two weeks from a major general election, right? And have you been wondering what is true? <laughs> what is this true or truth? And this morning we're going to talk about that we shouldn't give false testimony against thy neighbor is what we're going to see as the commandment. But here's the thing. You know, it's not just in the general election. You know, uh, my wife teaches kindergarten down at Daniels Elementary, and every Saturday night we wait until 5.30 to see what color we are on the map, and whether we're going to school or not. And then what map, you know, there's multiple maps and different colors. And I mean, I, I just think we're living in a time that people are struggling with what is true. You know, go back to the election side of things. I remember growing up, this is what you used to be able to do. You could listen to one candidate on one side and listen to the other candidate on the other side, and somewhere in the middle was truth, right? But right now, I only know when you listen to one candidate to another candidate if there's truth anywhere. And I know that sounds very judgmental and vindictive, and you can say, well, I'm going to beat the preacher up now. And I'm just saying, I'm not here to preach politics. I'm here to preach Jesus. I'm here to teach you that there is absolute truth that's right for you and for me, regardless of our political sense, regardless of what we think, and regardless if I even believe it. I've heard people say this when it comes to truth, all right? They'll say this phrase, and you've heard it as well. Well, God said it, and I believe it, and that settles it. Let me simplify it for you. God said it, and that settles it, <laughs> all right? It doesn't require you and I to believe whether that's true or not. God is the author and the perfecter of all truth, and it's for all people in all situations, in all circumstances, His Word is true. Now, we, we live in a society that says this when it comes to this, this ideal. I want you to speak your truth. Anybody heard this? Go ahead and get on Instagram, or Facebook, or the Twitter and speak your truth. Listen, there is true or there's not true. It's just that simple. And when it comes to this commandment, the ninth commandment. I'd like for you all to read it with me. We find it in Exodus 20, verse 16, and it says this. Let's all read this together. You shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. That sounds pretty straightforward. We should have learned this lesson in kindergarten, right? Well, I, this command 
it, it really comes to the idea of testimony. It's almost like a legal proceeding. But it's not just held in the legal proceeding. You know, you, you're getting sworn in to tell the truth. I, I will tell the truth and nothing but the truth. Right? So help me God. But listen, it's not just in those legal proceedings that we are required and, and called to tell the truth. We, we have so many things at our disposal today that we rely on eyewitnesses' accounts of what's taking place. You know, and, 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 and I think when it comes to truth or misrepresenting truth or the idea of a lie, there's a great old story about a rabbi. And the rabbi lived in a small town. And in this small town, the rabbi was well-respected because he was honest, he was hardworking, and he told the truth. And, and everybody respected him. Well, one day, a newcomer came into their village and started spreading misrepresentations and lies and rumors about the rabbi for no reason that the rabbi could ever figure out. And the people that he had served for many, many years who had always trusted him, always looked to him as the good example that he was, started in the back of their mind when they would see him walk or they would t talk or teach, they would have in the back of mind, well, I wonder if these rumors are true. Friends, we're guilty of this all the time. This is what we do. This is how we live. And so and this went on for some time. And the man who said such horrible things finally met the rabbi. They came across each other on the street. And the rabbi knew what the man was saying about him. And he still spoke to him as kindness and compassion. And, and the man finally was cut to the heart. And he confessed all that he had said about the rabbi. And said, I've done damage to your name and to your reputation. And he says, what can I do to make this right? And I don't know if you've heard this story, but the rabbi said to him, he said, I want you to go home and take your pillow off your bed and go outside on a windy day and tear your pillow open, rip it apart, and let all the feathers on that windy day just blow everywhere. And then the man did that and he returned to the rabbi and he said, I did what you asked me to do. Is there anything else? Because I still feel guilty. And the rabbi said, yes, take your pillowcase Go back and pick up every feather that blew away. And the man said, but that's impossible. And the rabbi looked at him and said, it's exactly my point. You see, when someone starts lying or gossiping or spreading rumors or being deceitful about you or in your name, we've all been victims of that on either side of the coin. If I can be honest with you this morning, I've had things said about me that I thought, holy cow, I must be the worst person alive. And we all know this phrase. You can say it with me. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will... Is that true? No. I'd rather you break my leg than say some of the things that you said about me. Maybe not. So no, none of you that are wanting to break my leg, just hold, it, hold back. Like somebody got up, and I was like, oh gosh. All right? But, but you understand what I'm saying. So what we are talking about today is giving false testimony against your neighbor, lying about someone. Once we release a lie, we can never fully regain the truth back, can we? And in fact, the lie kind of lives on and on. And, and as we'll see today, our lives are filled with opportunities to violate the ninth commandment, to give false testimony, to bear falsely against someone's name, to say, th to say things that are, that are extremely hurtful. We break this commandment when we give testimony to something that we did or maybe we did not do. In fact, we have a, a way of reporting it. We violate this command by lying and just not being simply truthful. So throughout the series, for each one of these commandments, we have connected them, a command with a, with a, a saying or a challenge for us. And here's our challenge today. It's great. It says that our challenge is a challenge with truth. Always be honest. You know, when the Ten Commandments were given, the, the Israelites had just left Egypt, and it had to be a place full of corruption, full of lies, full of, it was a very pagan society. Lying and cheating had to be something they were dealing with on a, on a day in and day out basis. So there's no reason to not believe that these were not only just commands of God, but these are everyday things that these folks were facing every single day, just like our society. You know, I, I remember an old preacher said, you know, I could get rid of all the gossip 
in the world if I could yank out every telephone and out of every house and I could go and shut down every beauty salon and barber shop. Well, then we got online digital <laughs> formats and we can go and bash, ruin someone's reputation. There's even services that you can pay for to correct your online reputation. That's how bad it is in our society right now. So you know that sometimes people ask, crazy questions of preachers, right? And they'll ask questions like this. If, can God make a rock so big that he could never lift it? You're like, that's so absurd. But what they're trying to do is catch God in uh, in a misrepresentation of truth. But I want to tell you, there is something that God can't do. You ready? Hebrews chapter 6, look what the word says. It says in Hebrews chapter 6, God did not say that, by two unchangeable things in, in which it is impossible, notice that, impossible for God to lie. In fact, Titus 1-2, Paul points out that God does not lie. In fact, some translations say <coughs> God cannot lie. It's impossible for God to lie. He's always honest. It's his very nature and character to be truthful and not to lie. In fact, in John 16, 13, we read that the Holy Spirit is called the Spirit of truth. And Jesus said of this, of the Holy Spirit, of him, he says in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Listen, Jesus didn't say he is a way or a truth. He said, I am the way and the truth. So when we are studying this idea about lying. This is a big concept throughout Scripture. So you and I might be struggling with different things, but I want you to understand God also says it's impossible for him to lie, but it also says he hates lying. In fact, lying is the complete opposite of the character of God. It's not just an offense of the person you're lying about or lying to, but it's an offense to God who made you in his image. In fact, Proverbs 19.5 says it this way, a false witness will not go unpunished, And whoever pours out lies will not go free. Now, can I be a little honest for a moment? In fourth grade, this is the biggest lie I've ever told in my life. And we've all are liars, all right? So I'm not the only one that's going to share a story like this. My mom and I had a clunker of a car in fourth grade, all right? And I went to school, and the kids were telling me at school that they got a brand new cars, all right? And I'd heard from enough kids when I was in fourth grade, Mrs. Pashas, class that I've heard enough about their cars and I knew our car you know we we worshiped the Lord if our car made it from basketball practice back to the house all right we said thank you Jesus we made it another a trip you know our car was one of those cars you could hear before you saw it does that make sense all right so whether it was <laughs> trying to slow down or even get going you could hear it both ways all right so I'd had enough and I, and I finally just looked at this kid when he said his parents got a new car. And I said, you know what? I said, I got some news to share in fourth grade, Miss Pash. I said, my mom just won on the radio. WZPL was giving a brand new Camaro away, and we won that sucker. That was a nice lie. I felt a little bit better about myself. But before I know it, it started going around the whole class, Miss Pash. Before I knew it, the rest of the day, I was walking down the hallways, and other teachers were like, congratulations. I was like, thanks. You know? And, and I knew I was dead when I went to basketball practice that night because guess what car would be pulling up to pick me up? Our old clunker, right? And so all the parents were talking to my mom, well, where's your new Camaro? Blah, blah, blah. What Camaro? What are you talking about? You know, and here I come out, and I knew I was dead, just dead to the right. And here's that verse again. It says, whoever pours out lies will not go free. It also tells us in a second where liars end up, Right? And I'll tell you, in fourth grade, for the next rest of the the semester, for the next nine weeks of school, I felt like I was already there. (laughs) Because the next day, I thought, oh, man, okay, I'm finally done with it. Everybody knows I lied, la, la, la. Next day, principal during announcements. Oh, yeah, one other thing. We want to congratulate Russell Jordan and his mother on winning the Camaro. And I was like, oh, man, here we go again. Lies. But listen to the two things and statements I want to help you overcome when you're dealing with this challenge in your own life. Number one, listen, the road of deception is a broad road, and it leads to destruction. Amen? I'm used to, when we're down in Beckley, when there's 35, 40, 50 of us in a room, you all can talk to me, all right? Because 
It's all right to, to want to say so. When I say amen, I hope to get a response on that. That's kind of like a greedy, all right? So, but isn't this true? The road to deception is broad road and it leads to destruction. This is, thank you. This is exactly what this means. And meaning this, there are many who will follow lies and they will lead to their destruction. This is the story of us. We were brought into this life and we bought into a huge lie. That same lie that Adam and Eve bought into in the garden is the same one that you and I buy into on a daily basis. And in fact, it's at the beginning of the Bible where we see lie and deceit. And at the very end of the Bible, like I said, this is where liars go. Revelation 21.8, but the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexual immoral, immoral, and those who practice magic arts and the idolaters, or we're thinking, man, I'm good. I'm, I'm not on that list. And the liars. And the liars. They'll be, as it says, consigned to the fiery lake of burning sulfur, sulfur. This is the second death. There is physical death, and then there is eternal death. And that eternal death is hell. Now listen, there's good news in this message. But we need to really define what lying is. So the beginning of the Bible and end of the Bible talks about where liars and deceivers go. And why is this a lie then? Well, we know that for the most part, when we lie, we do it for two reasons. And here they are. To protect ourselves or to promote ourselves. And both of them are in a prideful way. That's why we lie. I wanted to tell everybody we got a new car because I was sick and tired of our clunker. I wanted to feel better about myself momentarily. Hey, we got a new car. So to promote ourselves or to protect ourselves. We're, I'm embarrassed. You know, you can hear a car before you see it. I mean, that's just things that we all deal with. And, and it's all revolving around, guess what? Self. See, when Satan came and deceived Adam and Eve, he said and planted a seed of deceit and said, can can you have anything in the garden? I said, yeah, we can do anything we want in the garden except for eating that tree right there. And he said, did God really say that? So he planted a seed of doubt. You know what? The Bible says, and then they looked to that tree and it was pleasing to their eyes. So then they thought of themselves instead of God. And that's where the root of all lies come from. It's our challenge to always be honest. And can I just have a moment here with you ladies. I've been married now for 24 years, going on 25. There are certain questions that I would prefer you not to ask your husbands, okay? Like when you walk into the room and, and, and you say this, notice anything different? That is, a, yeah, yeah, be careful guys. That is a tough situation. I mean, because you don't know what to say. Or the worst one is when you come out in this dress that you're not really fond of and you say, does this dress make me look? Yeah, you know. You have to be honest. Now, I've changed all kinds of stuff. I blame the designer of the dress. I blame the dryer. I, blame, I mean, I've done everything. I know what to do to try to be truthful in this, but it is a difficult thing. And you say, well, that's just, you're being silly. No, I'm being honest. <laughs> Don't put ourselves in questions like that. And guys, we do that too. We do it in a lot of different ways. And what I'm trying to help us with is that, notice what Jesus says in John chapter 8. And he's talking to the religious leaders. And I wonder if he would be saying the same thing to the Christ followers and to the leaders of the church today. He said, you belong to your father, the devil. You want to carry out your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language. Man, that is powerful. For he's a liar and the father of lies. So when we are not telling the truth, we are not following the characteristic and the character of God. We're following the devil who is the father. And notice how it says he speaks his native language. Now you also know this phrase, liar, liar, pants on fire. It, huh, yeah, yeah, okay, here you guys go on with it. I just say the guy's just going to be on fire. But how do you feel if you have someone and you know someone's reputation is a liar? Don't you all kind of try to avoid them? And if you're going to say, well, no, well, maybe people are avoiding you. You see what I'm saying? This is a big deal. You're only as good as your word. 
And our words should represent the character of God, right? In contrast to God always being truthful, Satan, who is a liar, it's his native language, his first language, his first impulse is to lie because he wants the attention and the glory to be away from God and brought to himself. And it's exactly what he tries to deceive us in. In fact, the Bible has some very strong words uh, uh, for David, We've, he found this out. David described this for his enemies. Listen to how he described his enemy, enemies in Psalm 59, 12. He says, For the sins of their mouths, for the words of their lips, let them be caught in their pride. For the curses and lies they utter, consume them in your wrath. Consume them until they're no more. Then it will be known to the ends of the earth that God rules over Jacob. That's how God feels so strongly about lies. Strong words. But there are some ways I'm going to challenge you this morning. And you say, well, I don't try to lie. Good. Well, let's talk about some other challenges that come in the way of truth. And the first one I want you to think about is flattery. Well, there's nothing wrong with flattery. Now, look, I don't think you all really need to hear this one. Because you are the best, the brightest, the best-looking congregation of all the campuses. See what I just did there? You're the most honest. I think there's no better people in all the campuses. In fact, I like being up here better than I like being in Beckley. If I said something like that to you, you'd feel pretty good about yourself. I remember this exactly happening to me when I got into the pharmaceutical sales business. All right, I was naive, young, um, and there was this lady who was on my team, and every time she would see me, she would compliment my suit I wore. She goes, that's a good-looking suit. I was like, yeah, it is. Thanks. And she would, every time she see me, that's a good looking suit. Four months after me being there, and every time she's seeing me, my partner, she one week had to, an emergency and said, I need you to cover my territory. Can you do it? She knew exactly what she was doing with the suit comment. I built you up so I could get something, and that's what flattery does. In fact, look at Romans 16, 17 through 19. The Apostle Paul writes this way, I urge you, brothers and sisters, to watch out for those who cause divisions and put obstacles in your way that are contrary to the teaching that you have learned. Keep away from them, he says, for such people are not serving our Lord Christ, but their own appetites by smooth talk and flattery. They deceive the minds of naive people Everyone has heard about your obedience, so I rejoice because of you, but I want you to be wise about what is good and innocent about what is evil. There's smooth talk and flattery. I've had this conversation much, many times, much, many times, that's great English. I've had this conversation with my daughter a lot. She just went into middle school. And yes, I am a proud gun owner, and I'm not afraid to go to prison. So anyways, if you're going to mistreat my daughter, you know, that's how I feel about my, my little girl, Phoebe. And I told her, I said, you're going to see some guys. They're going to come up to you now in middle school, and they're going to, they're going to have some smooth talk. And they're going to say things about you. And you're going to think, man, they really think the world of me. But I, I said, be watchful. They have motives that aren't pure all the time. It's crazy you have to have a conversation like that with your sixth grade daughter, but you do. And guess what? I had that conversation with her when she was in third and fourth grade as well. That's the world we live in because that's how you get ahead. You, you tell someone. You build them up so you can come around the side. What else? What are some other ways we give false testimony? We exaggerate. <laughs> and if you don't think you're guilty of this, let's just pull up your online profile, <laughs> you know. I love grade report card time. You know what I'm saying? Because all you that have kids and grandkids that get straight A's, I'm going to know your kids' grades. But all those who have C's and D's, I never see them on, on, on the Facebook. We like to exaggerate. I, I, I don't know if you've noticed this, but I'm not a, a vegetarian. All right? I'm just not. And, and I like, when I moved to West Virginia, I knew I was going to get along great here. You know why? Pepperoni rolls and cinnamon rolls. And I'll be honest, if you get on and look at some ladies that I know, they make some amazing pepperoni rolls and cinnamon rolls, but you all take this like personal 
You know, if, you, if someone says that someone else's cinnamon rolls is better than yours, and you'll go into great lengths to tell about your cinnamon rolls. Well, listen, I'm a great judge of character and cinnamon rolls. So I need two or three brought to my name, and then I'll let you know how good your cinnamon rolls are, all right? But we exaggerate things all the time, right? If you don't think we exaggerate things, just go to a high school parking lot and look at the size of the trucks and the tires and the wheels of the teenagers, right? We love to exaggerate things. We like, oh, I'm going to get in danger here. We love to tell how great the Mountaineers are, right? How many championships do we have? Well, in rifle, (laughs) and then that's whatever we always go to. We're great in rifle, but we love to brag on our Mountaineers in the herd. Well, I think we understand exaggeration. Again, we're doing these things to promote ourselves or protect ourselves, but we also do by violating this command through gossip. And I don't think I really need to, talk about what it is. It's just wrong. It's plain and simple. Now, it doesn't count when we spread falsehood about other people's political views. That's what people say. Well, I got it. No, we are not to gossip. It's just plain and simple. We're not to spread lies, rumors, misinformation. You know, the hardest thing to do when someone's gossiping or spreading rumors about you is do what Jesus said. Remember when Jesus said, what he, what he told them when they were nailing him to the, the cross? He said, just turn the other cheek. It's hard to do that. You feel like you need to defend yourselves. You need to, no, just, just let that because it will be like leaps of coal on top of their head if you just let it alone because God will deal with that. But if you're someone that uses this phrase, I'm going to call you today to, to stop right now. You ever been around somebody? I'm not one to gossip, but... Everything they say after but is what? Okay, so call them out on it (laughs) and say, stop. I'm not one to gossip, but stop. (laughs) Just quit right now. And you don't have to listen to it. You don't have to be a part of it. Finally, another thing I would like for you to consider this morning and the way that we break this uh, commandment is that we are deceitful. (laughs) We are deceitful. And we use it a lot. Lying is not just saying or typing. Let me use the word communication. Lying is not just communicating what is untrue, but it's also communicating what is untrue. We leave parts of the whole story out to make someone look bad or make ourselves look better. Prevent from us getting to get us what we want. Deception tells part of the truth, but not the whole truth. It's intended to misdirect someone else. Several times in Scripture, we are told, do not be deceived. We shouldn't deceive others either because it is all the people who serve God of the truth. We should be truth seekers. We should find truth in all situations, but we need to be careful not to deceive. Our challenge is always to be honest, and that means we need to seek truth and be careful not to buy into other people's lies. Here's the truth about truth, if this makes sense. This is a great sentence, so I hope you're listening. We often shy away from truth. You want to know why? Because truth doesn't always put us in the best light. Right? I mean, can I be honest? I I think back to my fourth grade encounter in my life with Mrs. Pash and the whole school that turned out to be a huge lie. I think it cost me my hair. You know, I really do. This is why I go right back to. And in fact, the drummer today was just showing off with the locks of mane that he has running down, you know. Don't lie, buddy. It could cost you your hair. All right? That's why I'm going to go to. But, but here's the thing about truth. It doesn't always put us in the best light. So we like to manipulate the truth a little bit or tell a little bit of exaggeration or a little white lie here or there so that it makes us look better. But if we don't let truth expose us, then the darkness will enslave us. Let me say that again. If we don't let truth expose us, darkness will enslave us. Do you you ever wonder why God gave us these Ten Commandments in the law? You know, the Bible tells us why God gave us the law. It was to give us as a schoolmaster. Do you know what that means? The law was given to expose how sinful we really are. You know, in this series, I hope you all have experienced this. Each week I've come in, I've realized by the fourth week I, during this 10-week series, I need to be wearing my steel-toed boots to church. Anybody else had their toes stepped on during this series? Well, let me un- let you in on a little secret. The staff, the leaders, when we thought up this series, we weren't aiming for your feet. 
We were aiming for your heart. And so when the truth exposes us and it tells us how we're not like God, in fact, Jesus said it in John 8, 32. You all are familiar with this verse. Then you will know the truth and finish it, and the truth will set you free. See, the road to deception is broad, and that road leads to destruction, but there is an escape for us, and the truth is we, that Jesus came to set us free. And which leads us to the other statement I want to make about this challenge with telling the truth. This, that, this statement comes with the four other statements, and I, you thought I was almost finished, but just give me just five minutes of your time. And here is what is the important part of the message. There are four aspects of that, how you and I can live in truth. And all four of them are found in John 8, 31 and 32. Look at what the scriptures tell us. Jesus, to the Jews, he said, who believed him, that's the first one, if you hold to my teaching, there's the second one, you are really my disciples, then you will know the truth, and then you'll be set free. You see, I told you in the very beginning of the message that God said it, and people say, God said it, and I believe it, and that settles it. And I said, ultimately, if God said said it, it settles it. But when it comes personally, you have to choose, am I going to believe God or am I going to believe a lie? And that's a personal choice that each one of us has to make. So here's the first step. The first step in living in truth, you got to believe it. you got to believe that God is who he says he is and you believe and you live in truth. i got to believe it. Secondly, you got to obey it. You have to obey it. Notice what this, back in verse 31, he says, to the Jews who believed him, there's belief. And then he said, if you hold to my teachings, and that word is obedience. And a lot of people don't like that word. But here's here's what that word means. Jesus didn't say, if you love me, you'll believe me. You know what he said? If you love me, you will obey me and keep my commandments. Now, we just had in our sermon series the, 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 the children are to obey their parents. Isn't that in there, in the Ten Commandments? Yes, shake your head, yes. You were here. And if you weren't, it's online, it's a great message. <laughs> Listen, obey your parents. You know what happens when children obey your parents? It shows the, the parents that the kids love them. That your children love you enough that they want to obey what you say. Nothing makes you feel more prideful, I guess, and maybe in a right sense here, that when your children do the things that you ask them to do when, when, when they're not around, when you're not around. Listen, I had a great story on this. Um, I, you know, I coach basketball, and I coach my sons in, in, in travel league basketball, and this goes all the way back to, I think they were probably in fourth or fifth grade, and I was coaching the team, and one of the other players on the team, their dad, um, uh, who owns uh, Marquee Cinemas, uh, that's our cinemas down in Beckley, and they have like 11 others on the East Coast, um, he, he had terminal cancer. And so during the basketball season, his dad had to go stay in the hospice house. And I remember going and winning the championship, and there was nothing better than giving it to Cash and giving that trophy to take to his dad. Curtis ended up passing away before our season was over. Cash was the youngest one. He had a sister, Riley, and then he had the oldest one, Dylan. And it was hard on Dylan because Dylan was, I think, in eighth grade, maybe going to ninth grade at the time when his dad passed away. And I'd substitute teaching the Raleigh County Schools, and I would see Dylan in school, and I'd watch him, and I'd talk to him and encourage him. Well, Dylan got into uh, trucks, diesels, all right? I mean, he really got into it. I mean, he had some awesome trucks. And and just the other day, he was selling his truck because he was actually going to school up here in Marshall, and he needed something a little cheaper on gas. And we saw it on that yard sale page, and you know, my sons own a um, lawn mowing business, and they were looking for a diesel truck to pull their trailer. My story uh, goes to, we contacted Dylan, and I've known this family for a long time. We've been through a lot together. I said, hey, Sam might be interested in your truck. And he, he said, hey, coach, and that's how he knows me. He said, can I have your phone number? And I gave it to him. He called me. He said, I don't want Sam to buy this truck. I said, why? And he said, well, it's a good truck, but it's got some issues, and I don't think he should have to deal with those issues. I got to see his mom the other day. I got to tell her that story. She started crying. Because you know what? Nothing makes, 
you know that you've done okay with your kids when they do the right thing when you're not there. And the same thing that when God looks at his children, when we obey God. So let me wrap this up here. So it says that if you'll hold to my teaching, so you believe, you obey, and thirdly, we know. And then it says, then you will know the truth. You see, that's so important in our society today. We've got to have Christ followers who know the truth. I mean, the things that are being said in the name of Jesus that are totally against God's word today are doing more damage to our cultures and our community because Christians can't agree on the word of God. Or they distort it or misrepresent it. And they do such damage that there are those who believe, as as the book of Romans says it this way, that those who do evil will be called things that they do evil as right. And that's exactly our society. And they're saying that things that are evil are right and God approves of it. So this is vital that we have to believe and we have to obey and we have to know. And what's the last part of the verse? You shall know the truth and the truth will what? Set you free. You'll be released from deception. In fact, Jesus says it this way in Luke 4, 18. The spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom to the prisoners, and recover sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. That's why Jesus came. He wanted to set us free from the captives of lies and deceit. He doesn't want us to buy into the native language of Satan. He doesn't want us to be Christians who tell little white lies or exaggerate here or gossip a little bit here. He wants us to be set free. He wants us to be redeemed. And probably one of the most powerful passages of Scripture of who Jesus is that sums up almost the entire Bible is found in John's Gospel, the 14th verse. And it says this, The Word became flesh, and He made His dwelling among us. We have seen His glory, the glory of the One and His only Son, who came from the Father, notice, full of grace and truth. And see, I think we live in a society today that wants the grace part of God, but they can't handle the truth. We live in a world that can't handle the truth of the Word of God. But we want the grace. God, I want you to save me. What we want right now and what our world is desiring of Jesus, they don't want Him to be the Lord and Savior. They want Him to be their fire insurance policy to get them out of hell. Because the truth brings everything to light. But notice what this says about Jesus. He came full of grace and truth. You don't have to have one without the other. And if you're here this morning that have been caught up in violating the ninth commandment, I'm not preaching to you. I'm imploring you on Christ's behalf to come back to Jesus. Like I said, these sermons have not been easy to deal with. If they've been uncomfortable, praise God for it, because we're telling you the truth. But come to the realization that we're all lawbreakers. And I want you to get this mental picture in your head. Here's God, and here's us on the earth, and suspended at one point in history for one people, I mean for all people, for all time, is Jesus on a cross. And there is the balance of grace and and truth. No one comes to the Father except through Jesus. I am the way and the truth and the life. But also, we can't come and say, look, I told more truth than my neighbor did, and expect that we're going to be saved. We have to be saved by the grace of God. So Jesus comes full of grace and truth. Will you pray with me? Father God in heaven, we humbly come before you this morning. Lord, just like it was in fourth grade, (laughs) I still feel the anxiety. I still feel the knots in my stomach when I uttered out those words, my mom won the Camaro on WZPL. And Lord, I know 
that those who are praying with me now that are here, that are online, I will come back and catch up on this sermon. They know the weight of a lie, of a misrepresentation, of a gossip, of a rumor, of an exaggeration, of flattery. They know the weight of it because we've all done it. But Lord, I also want them to know the freedom that comes by saying, I would try to fix it. I would try to put the feathers back in the pillow if I could. But when we come to Jesus, he says, my child, where are your accusers now? My child, you are forgiven. And in fact, you're not only forgiven, I'm going to pay your debt. I'm going to not only forgive you, but I'm going to put the weight of your sin on my cross. And in one moment, in one instant, all that anxiety, all that guilt, all that shame is undone. And I look up and I see a Savior who would be willing to do it all over again just so I could have eternal life with Him. I don't know how to say thank you enough. So what I'll do, Father, is I'll do my best. And even when I fail and even when I sin and even when I lie or give false testimony again, I will come and trust you that your grace is enough for your power is made perfect in our weakness. Bless those who have decisions to make. Bless the decision time, I humbly pray in Jesus' holy name and all God's people said. Amen. Let's stand. Let's worship. We need to have a come to Jesus moment. Understand it's not coming for your truth. You're coming to his truth. So as we stand and sing, as we're being led and worship, Joel will be over here. I'll be over here. You want to talk to somebody, pray, whatever you need. Have a come to Jesus moment.